I might have shot the policeman, but it could have affected his a lot more people than the policeman, his family, his children, he had children and that. So I've got to kind of, you know what I mean, be the man and realise what I've done here. I've got children of my own, you know, it's not, I know it's us against the police, I know how it goes, but at the end of the day, I'm a human being, he's a human being. And, you know what I mean, I want to die with nothing hanging on to me. Uh, all I've got is big guns, broken jeans, bad combination on these ghostly streets. Mad complications, so we over-squeeze. Sad conversations, always over beef. Got on the heat, that's compulsory. The streets ain't heard the most of me. Lyrically bossy B. Sick and tired of bullshit. I'm trying to change my life and progress. Yeah, I'm back like I never left. Yeah, so we're just arrived at the um, radio station, secret location. Quickly go play a few tracks. I think this is our way through, I ain't got a clue where we're going. Right, like I said, special guest inside the studio, Stanner. Yo, 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 what's up? Stanner. I heard the man's story and I just had to bring him in. Yeah, um, I went to prison for shooting a police officer in 2006. Oh, sentence you got for that? I got an IPP sentence of a minimum six years and I served eight years. IPP, what's that? No, basically, it's, you're in prison for the protection of the public. So if your risk is high, you ain't getting released. No matter if you've done the time that the judge has given you, you ain't getting released. So that's what it was. I was a risk to the public and they put me on a life license. You done wrong. Yeah. You've done your time. Yeah. And, and, and now you're looking to, to, to apologise. You're looking for the policeman. Yeah, 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 we're trying to contact the policeman. So obviously you've got a lot of kids that uh, follow you and idolise you for, for, for good reasons and bad reasons. Yeah, there's kids, you know what I mean, that they, 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 they hear that I shot a police officer and they're like, yeah, big him up, big him up, but I don't, I, don't, I don't want ratings for that. I want to get praised for the good things that I do, not the bad things. And I don't want the kids to go out there and follow me because what I've done was wrong. Yeah, so we're here. Back to go in, try and make contact with the gentleman that I shot. A little bit nervous, but let's get it done. Working at City Just some paint in there. Yeah, so, so when you were in court, did you have much interaction with the police officer that you shot? No, only when he came to give his account mm -hmm. was the time that I saw him. That was it. And do you know the extent of his injuries and the kind of the impact of the sh um, shooting on him? Yeah, they said that he had, um, he was going through stress. He was, he was depressed. He had, he had depression mm. and um, the bullet hit him in the um, top of his shoulder came, top of his arm came out his shoulder, his left shoulder. And uh, he said he was, he was, you know what I mean? It was a traumatic event his family and that he couldn't um, play with his son how he used to play with his son, his arms and that, do you know what I mean? He couldn't fire him up in the air and that, do you know what I mean? So that was, that, that bit there did touch me that. What do you think you would want to say to him if you were given the opportunity to speak to him now? <clears throat> like, obviously I'd want to apologise for my actions. It, like, I'd want him to know that it wasn't personal and it was uh, I don't want to call it an accident because I was firing a gun so it wasn't an accident but it wasn't deliberate mm -hmm. it wasn't intended for it wasn't intended for him I just would want him to basically say whatever he wants to say to get his closure if he wants to say anything but if you said to him that the bullet wasn't for him don't you think he's going to say, well, who was it for? It was like a warning shot, like, get back. And I was just, bam, 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 get out of here, I don't want to get arrested. What would you like to achieve at the end of this? If it does affect him and he still thinks about it, I hope that it can bring some closure to him and his family and they can feel like, you know what, that, that did actually help. What's, what's been the hardest thing for you? To see my family looking at me and thinking, oh, is that what you're capable of? It is, it's like, no, I'm not that person. I ain't that person. I don't just, I don't just, but that's a person that I was for a very short period of time. So moving on from here, we'd be attempting to make contact and then go from there.
This is my little miss, Zara Lee. She's gonna be two next month. Um, I've got two boys as well, 13 and 11. Been with my missus since I was 15 years old. She stuck by me through all of the, 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 the crap in and out of prison and we're still here making beautiful kids. <laughs> I'm not that person anymore that pulled that trigger on that day. And I, I really want to know how I became that person because it's just affected so many years of my life. So I need to get to the bottom of it in order to progress. You right? So how long ago was this? This was, I think, 2005 slash six. Hey, young boy, 1920. With the goons them in the background. Yeah, you know how I do. I spit about what I've been through. Put a bullet in you, rub you, then bin you. I'm from these streets, on these beats. Spitting my life, see me flicking my knife. Ripping your spine at your back. I put a nine to your hat. Brat, brat. Talking some nerd, some horrible stuff. I was a menace. Well, see, when I see these kids out there now, yeah, I was like that. Yeah. Hoodie, tracksuit, two tracksuit bottoms, yeah, and just moving every day. Just, they're just doing so much. Do you know what I mean? Everything, mopeds, cars, getting arrested. I was just, a, I was an actual 110% road man. You know what I mean? And I was living in hostels and that as well. That horrible lifestyle on edge. People want to kill you because you, you've stolen something and all that. I ain't, I don't live, I ain't got that no more. I don't, I don't do none of that. That was a piece. Yeah. My little mixtapes. But yeah, there's my albums up there. The ones I've released. What's your favourite mixtape, guys? Do you have a favourite? Porridge is mad. I was going to say that. Because I recorded it in the cell, it's one take business, no ad libs, no stabs, man in the background doing all that for you. Do you get what I'm saying? There's no. Where was the studio? In the cell. In your cell? No, in another guy's okay. cell downstairs. He had, we did it on a mini display, it had a mic, so the mini display had a stereo, we hooked it up. I don't know how he did it, <laughs> I don't know how he did it. Where? But yeah, he used to loop the beats on the PlayStation, oh. on the um, Music 2000 or whatever it is. And that was it. My favourite bars from yeah. Porridge are, oh, my family's what it's all about. Hey yo, my family's what it's all about, so don't be sidetracked by all this other shit I talk about. Cause I've been locked up for four years and all I thought about is being in the park of my sons, kicking a ball about. Could you take us to the scene of the crime, talk us through it and tell us what happened? Yeah, I can't take you to the scene because um, I've been banned from Wolfen Forest as conditions of my, um, my parole, so if I go for Forest, I'll breach my licence back in jail. Maybe you lot could go there, get some photographs of the street. When you get the photos, I'll talk you through it. It was June the 27th, 2006. It was hot, a hot day. I think I was 20, 20 years old. We've gone to Garby's to get my hair cut. Me and the guys that I was hanging around with, we didn't get along with another group of guys from a different estate. You know how it goes in this gang, turf, bullshit, post gold wars, and they were at this barber shop. That's it, I've went and got my firearm, and I've come back, I've jumped out and I've fired at them. I didn't know at the time, I was under surveillance um, by police, and that's where the police officer's car is pulled here first. I'm standing on the pavement with my firearm behind my car, He's pulled up, he started spraying CS spray from his car seat over towards me, but it didn't hit me. I just ran this way, back down Bone Road, and the car was reversing up towards me so fast. Bam, 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 I'm running. He's coming, bang! Shot's gone off, that's shot number two. And that is what shot that injured him. So now he's been hit, I don't know he's been hit. I just know he's smashed the window, because I've heard the window smash. It's 3.30 in the daytime. Um, kids, school's finishing. I'm not aware of this. But obviously at my trial, they brought this to my attention. There was kids around and all that, but I wasn't, I was in tunnel vision. In total, six shots were fired. Um, one at the, the rival gang, one that hit the police officer, 
and four at one officer that was pursuing me. I got away basically. I was exhausted. It took every, all my energy out of me. So once I got, I went to sleep for a couple hours. When I woke up, it's all on the news. That was it, they're saying my name, they're looking for me. End of story. It's bullshit, innit? And it's where it leads to prison and death and sorrow and grown men trying to retrace their steps to make it right. I'm rapping for my life, take that literal. I ain't accomplished nothing as a criminal I'm 30 years of age and I'm ashamed Cause these younger shout my name like I'm invincible Hello? Hi Dean, how you doing? It's uh, Daniel Just uh, waiting to just give you a bit of an update basically uh, On where we are, obviously we haven't spoken for a couple of weeks um, So yeah, we've been attempting to locate uh, the victim We haven't managed to locate his details um, he, he does seem to have left the police Okay. Unfortunately, yeah, the process takes a bit of time. Okay, no problem, man. Thanks a lot, though. How do you feel about him not serving as a police officer no more? Um, yeah, well, I don't know. Depends on why, innit? Wouldn't like it to be because of that incident, to tell you the truth. Why not? Because obviously then it makes me responsible, innit? Do you know what I mean? You might not have a job right now. This is my favourite video in the world. So that's my mum there. She's very shy. My name's Jasmine, we're having a great time. That's over my dad. I'm Dean Sherman and I'm Dickie Dog. Look at me. I was cool. I didn't have not a problem in the world. It's mad to think this little six-year-old here will grow up to be that guy running around with firearms, shooting police officers. That's my mum four years before she died. She died of pneumonia. That was the cause of her death. Shortly after that, my dad, I suppose, my dad was really ill. He died of cancer. And that was 10 months after my mum died. I was... 9, 10, 9, 10, 11. Me, my brother and my sisters, we all got se um, separated and we all went living in different parts of London and that, foster homes, family members and whatnot. I really want to find out from my brother and my sisters, you know, what, how they think, why I chose the path that I chose, what really led up to me pulling that trigger that day why they didn't go the same path as me, because we've never really spoken our childhoods. This is my bro, Raymond. Hello, my name's Raymond Stanby and I'm 11 years old. He's a key worker. He was 15 and 16 when my mum and dad died. Um, it's my sister, she's a social worker. My name is Jamie Stamps and I'm 9 years old and I'm Saint Granddaddy's granddaughter. Uh, she was 13 when my mum, 14 when my dad died. This is my little sis, Jade. This is Jade. Say hello. Control! What have you got your man? She was 6 years old. She's a legal advisor, law graduate. Do you think that our childhood, my childhood, is the reason for my actions or do you feel like it is just a personal thing that I was just a bad behaved uh, child? Because yeah, at the end no. of the day, you can't blame on the childhood if you two, you, us three. No, because, every, no because everybody has different reactions to things. Everybody has different emotional like barriers of how they deal with it. That my opinion of why you went into the life of crime, you needed some sort of boundaries. Somebody to come and put that place in and say, you need to be in at nine o'clock. When you're a certain child, in the, that you behave a certain way and people want to discipline you, your uncles, your aunts, but they know they can't, they don't want to be your parent. So it gets to the point where they can't really discipline you the exact same way when you're 
off the rails. And I feel like I was that guy. I, like, I feel like advice. everyone, yeah, I took advantage yeah. a bit. When I was young, like, oh, you can't slap me, you're not my dad. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'm, so I'm just going to be bad, innit? Some of the homes you were going in to weren't the right environment. There were things going on in those houses that, you know, shouldn't have really been going on. And I think that's when your crime and your behaviour really st um, started to change. Yeah. We went from four children being at home in a foundation that our parents had built for us. We had a tragedy, and which is rare, and you know it, it broke us as individuals, and we had to grieve all different ways. We were kids. You didn't get that right support at that time. I think that you, if, just looking at you. Or do you think I rejected it? I think that you rejected it. But even if you rejected sit, it, it should yeah, have, it should have still been coming. But you were still young, so, yeah. so someone can come and give that there's first responsibility. hand and take you. And... Did you have rebellious years? Where? I don't think I had like rebellious. I don't know. I feel like with me, I think like it affected me in different ways. Like I had a lot of like support from my older siblings to be able to do that. Like even what happened with you with your legal stuff, yeah, that, that made me want to study yeah, law. That's, oh, like, so, that's the oh, reason so, why I wanted to study okay, it. Okay, so you're saying it had an influence. My yeah, it had a, a good influence yeah. on me in that sense though, because it made me want to understand. I never forget coming to your trial. So no, and this is very interesting, yeah, that you said that. For me, innit? Because now that I'm looking at it, yeah, it's like, just imagine our childhood. I don't know if you lot have actually really looked in it. Like, we had a lot of social workers around us. You're a social worker. We had a lot of key workers, people at school, that would pay a special attention to, to us. To us, yeah. You're a key worker. You must see kids and think that you're me. Do, or you're that, my little brother, you're my little sister. Yeah, 100%. And you are in law for the reasons that you see your brother. Yeah, that was the main reason for me. Like when I started, I remember, so the childhood remember coming home. All in the direction yeah. That yeah, man, it was interesting to talk about life growing up and that. I've never really got the chance to do that with them. Dean, it's uh, Daniel from Bristol, London. Just a bit of an update, actually. Managed to get the police officer addressed. So the next process for us, we're just going to be sending him a letter saying that you'd like to engage in a conversation with him. As soon as we do hear anything, uh, we'll let you know. It was very valuable speaking to my brother and my sisters. I think it would be really important to speak to an, an, an uncle or an aunt that I lived with after my parents died. The transition really from when I went from being that young 10 year old boy who just lost his mum and dad to going out on the streets and committing crime in and out of prison they would be able to give me some information that I've never had. Yeah, man. Yes, man. I was living with you for, for a while, it? I went to school, I got mm -hmm. kicked out of a few schools when I was living with you. And obviously, it was thrown into your path to be like the dad. So how was that? Was it like sometimes I might have been misbehaving? For me, you for might me, thought, well, right, well, for I, me I it's just to, normal. I need to strong arm it. No, but I could not deal with Dean like a... Uh, Strict father figure than like, because I know that his pain. I know I can see. It. I could feel his pain. You know what I mean? When I look back, I could see the the kind of the transition from you being this boisterous little boy, happy Dean, singing, drawing, and doing that kind of stuff. You could see the, I could see the the process of of the frustration and the sadness, but it was like there was a, a torment inside you, and and that's what I could sense. So it was frustrating for me not to be able to do anything about it, because what can I do in that sense? What was it like for you, like, when I'd got older and I'd maybe committed a crime or did something out there? It wasn't a shock, because of that torment that you could see inside you, knowing who you are, it could be because of the age that you were, 10, 11 years old, which to me is a very difficult age. So for me, it, it, was, it was like being in this a trap and I can't do anything. I want to reach out, but I, I can't. I don't know how to now. And that's, that's what it was like. But the main thing was, I think for me, was this overwhelming sense of fear for you. Well, I'm going to touch on a little part where I think that Dean really changed. Your dad died of cancer, you know? And you know, was, this cancer was eating him away. And you knew that we had to send him back to Jamaica, to my brother, your uncle Leroy, he does herbal medicine and we thought that he would prolong his life even a bit more, which he did. He wanted to come back home to see his kids. That was his last wish. Even though he was told 
that if he came back, he would die. Oh, it was so shocking. And then when we went to get him into the car, we couldn't get him in the car because he was in so much pain. I can remember coming away down to Tooting, getting on Eswin Road, knowing that this front door is going to open in a minute, and I know that you was at the front door. As we stopped and I opened the door, and you opened the front door, yeah. and the day, and the minute you saw your dad, I can remember the scream, and you jumped over the car bonnet. And I think from that time, I didn't know if you could be around him. Yeah, I do remember. I do remember that day still. Oh. Like, cause obviously, I knew that my dad gone to Jamaica. So when he's come back, he just looked different, innit? it? That, that was it, that's all I can remember, that he looked different. And I was, I don't even know, that was just a mad day. Looking back at it now, you get me, I can see that he was trying to be strong, you get what I'm saying? Like, and that's the mad thing. I think, that's, I think that was the changing point. Because I think um, he couldn't be around no one then after that. I think he couldn't even accept family. I don't think anyone that's close to him, I don't think he could even be around. The friend, the roads on the, the people on the road became his friends. And from there, I think that's where he did, you know what I mean? Lost his mum, then lost his dad a year after. I couldn't take it. It was like a crashing, you know what I mean? I think I've been selfish for a lot of years. Because so much has always been going on in my life. But it's about that time that I start living my life properly and really making them proud of things, doing things that they can really be proud of. So we're off to meet the guys for restorative justice. They've been trying to track down the police officer who was shot. Are you right? And um, you they've called me for an update. Yeah. How's it going? Uh, it's fine, thanks. Yeah. I've just been kind of like a little bit anxiously waiting, you know? OK. We do have an update for you. I, I managed to have quite a good conversation with him. He said he doesn't want to revisit that period of his life. He said he had quite a few regrets um, about what he did at the time, and he kind of wished he'd maybe reacted a different way to avoid being shot, essentially. Um, he said it had a greater effect on his wife, and his wife died two years after no. uh, the shooting. Um, he did say that the shooting had really impacted her a great deal, um, and she was, yeah, she was quite angry. That's sad, man. Yeah. That's sad. He did say that um, he didn't mind me feeding this back to you. Um, he said he wasn't happy with the sentence. He felt it should have been longer. He said at this stage he didn't want to engage in a restorative justice process. From what he'd seen in your rap career, he didn't feel that you'd been showing any remorse in your lyrics. Uh, the way the music was glorifying guns, glorifying that culture of drugs, guns, and he was basically saying he didn't like the influence that that had on young people in the community. And he, he essentially said he would like to see you um, to put more back into your community. If he saw there was any sort of change or evidence of that in your lyrics, then he would maybe consider wanting to speak to you or engaging with you, basically. He did actually wish you well, and he said, I wish you every success in your rap career. Um, no, wow. Well, yeah, it's... <laughs> well, no, obviously, it's yeah. A, there's a lot of stuff. The, the wife thing, that's just it for me, to tell you the truth. Two years is not... It's not far distance, because the trial... Didn't have the trial for, like, 18 months. 
his wife like must have passed very shortly after that. It must have been very fresh. There must have been a lot of blame on his side. Your, your, your last days, you, you want happiness, good mm. memories, do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I, I probably feel a bit, a bit guilty. Yeah, I'm being honest. It makes me feel a bit worse. Like, and I didn't want to feel worse, to tell you the truth. You get me? But I do think that there is positives. I feel a little embarrassed that he's been following the career and that's all he's seen. Mm -hmm. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, that's a bit embarrassing because he must be just looking thinking, you're a joke. But, um, yeah, man. But I'm just grateful that he, he, he replied and obviously he wants me to do better. That's one thing I have to be doing, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Trying to put back into the community like, and make sure that these kids are not ending up the way that I did. I understand that he's kind of like trying to push me in that right direction, like, look, go that way. And that's advice that I'll just never, I'll never turn down. I'll take it, I'll cherish it, do you know what I'm saying? If I was to manage to speak to him this week, would there be anything immediately that you'd want me to say? My sorry is in it for his wife's death. I'm so sorry for his loss. Whether it was to do with this situation or not to do with this situation. And I don't want him to feel like he was any part of the blame for my actions. Like whether he stayed in the car, whether he got out of the car, that was going to happen that day. Mm -hmm. He's just thinking to himself, look, I'm a good man. I signed up to be a police officer to help. He didn't do nothing wrong that day. I wanted to thank him for his response because it, it is going to help me. I'm going to keep my offer to meet him and apologise and explain or whatever open. And I don't cry no more. Real two don't look up to the sky no more. I'm cold like ice, you know. No MOP, but I live a life of crime. Once upon a time, yeah, that was my life. If his sole reason for not wanting to meet me is because of what he's seeing in the music and, you know, social media, then I just want him to know that I'm a storyteller. I'm trying to tell my story, but I do understand and I will definitely, you know, go check out the things that I've posted and um, if there's anything that is coming across as negative, I'll definitely, you know, either delete it or word things better so they, so they understand that this is not who I am anymore. I'm not out here promoting violence, trying to commit crime, kidnap, shoot people and all that. Has. If he's watching this, this is your opportunity to speak to him. So why don't you just look in the camera and, and, and say what you want to say? Um, look, I made a huge mistake um, in 2006. I'm deeply sorry to you. I'm deeply sorry to your family. I'm deeply sorry for your loss. I hope, I hope, I pray that this documentary, this short film, do you know what I mean? Kind of gives you some closure and um, not that you forgive me or anything, but so you can just move on with your life, hopefully, when you're ready, when you maybe see a change in me, you'll be ready to meet me and take it from there. But I ain't done a thing, not a thing at all. But waste my time behind them prison walls That's the minimal of what my pistol calls Cause I weren't even there to see my kiddies born Had to hear them talk through prison calls See them walk in visit halls Photos on my picture board Reminding me that I missed it all Birthdays were the worst days I